Now, did you get your iPhone 10 pre-order in? Were you one of the few lucky chosen? Well, producer Jules is going to share some thoughts, share some thoughts uh, on this topic, especially after a fun Twitter conversation. And also, uh, is Microsoft working on yet another folding tablet design? Uh, Verizon's going to be taking the cap off of 4K streaming video. And we have a special guest this week, Shimon Das from Joyed Now, will join us as we open the Pocket Now Weekly mailbag to tackle your top questions. We've got a lot to talk about, so make sure you're charged and ready for episode 276 of the Pocket Now Weekly. Recorded October 27th at noon Pacific time, this is the weekly podcast where we discuss, dissect and discuss those gadgets that make our lives mobile. I said- Where we discuss people with discuss, our- Discuss, it's like jewelry. I combined the two words and that's an actual word that doesn't mean what I need it to mean. <laughs> Smartphones, tablets, and wearables is all the stuff you wished existed when you were a kid, and Andromeda was just a Star Trek knockoff starring Kevin Sorbo. I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell, senior editor at Pocketnow.com, joined as always by Plucky, podcast producer Mr. Jules Wong on the East Coast. How's it going, buddy boy? I mean, it's also the nearest galaxy to us in the Milky Way. Like, don't it's true. disrespect that. Don't hey, disrespect no, that. I, I know that Star Trek is all up in Not your about this, and it's all about my love of Kevin Sorbo. I, I don't believe I've shared that <laughs> enough on this podcast, just how dreamy I think that dude is. And I, I, in, in all seriousness, Kevin Sorbo is all right. I, I really I really enjoy his work. I really wish he were in other projects, but that's neither here nor there because we also have a guest this week, uh, Mr. Shimon Das. Thank you so much for joining the Pocket Now Weekly. Thank you so much for having me here. It's great. Feels nice. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I, mean, like, I, I, would, I would hate for you to be like, oh, I'm here under protest. Yeah, or, well, I mean, he's also doing the best he can under, like, it's 1230 on a Saturday. He, he could be sleeping. That's true. You you, that you are be... living in our future. I I uh, when we're <laughs> offline, I hope that you'll share what happened with the stock market so that I can take advantage of some insider trading. Of course, I'm like clearing the path for you all, past dwellers. So, yeah. <laughs> and we being safe. <laughs> so that third so, uh, cup of coffee is coming. Real quick, before we jump into some of the top headlines, uh, Shaman, can you tell us a little bit about what you do over on uh, Droid Now? And I know um you you've been uh, particularly active in uh, various HTC communities. Yes. So uh, a little bit about myself. I am Shimon. If that's a, kind of a tough name to pronounce, it's easy. You can incorporate it with Pokemon if that makes any sense at all. <laughs> so um, I consider myself as a content creator, specifically towards tech, because I love technology. And uh, so basically, I take over uh, about content writing, uh, creating some videos, fun videos, some really ridiculous ones, <laughs> which I find funny. So <laughs> there's that. And then uh, about the HTC thing you said, yes, I do contribute towards their communities. It's fun. Excellent. Well, and, and I did catch your, your Oreo video recently. So I, I, I oh, thought God. That very helpful um, <laughs> tutorial on how to get Oreo on any Android device. And I would highly yeah, recommend people go to every that time. channel to see that. Yeah, yeah <laughs> indeed. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to the butter chicken flavor of Oreos coming out mm -hmm. in this limited edition. That's yeah. Delicious. Can't wait for um, it, man. I, I'm, I, well, I'm, you know, because... I, I ate some butter chicken last night, and they're like, I, I love this dish, and uh, I think it needs to be in all things. But that's uh, the running joke is... between us and, and between me and uh, Shimon. So, yeah. oh, it's butter just... chicken, and I just wa yeah, walked right into yeah. your inside joke, yeah, and... and and his and his joke to everyone, basically, too. Oh, okay, well, yeah, I apologize good. for ruining your joke, and I will endeavor not to do so again. No, it fits. It, it fits perfectly well. Uh, no, good. <laughs> I, I am completely clueless as to what's happening in this exact moment. But before we, uh, well, just so that we don't turn this into an inside joke food podcast again. Hey, the joke's on you, and it should be on you that we should get the questions from today, this podcast, this hour, right now. Uh, you can contact us through Twitter with that PN Weekly hashtag. I know we were trying to get to that, and I made it very painfully slow in the transition. But <laughs> <laughs> Going on to that. Hashtag PN Weekly on Twitter. Get your questions in while we have Shimon on the air. And also, uh, talk about uh, emails since we've been piling up the mailbag a little bit. Uh, we're starting to do this thing where we just pile it on for the end of the month, the last week of the month, if we can, or whatever. And uh, the address to do that at is 
podcast at pocketnow.com. So podcast at pocketnow.com or hashtag PN Weekly while we're live here at 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, it's all wonderful. It's all, all fun. We want to hear from you. Gorgeous. And uh, we've got a news block rundown. Jules, do we want to just uh, blitz this or do you want to go story by story? I'll, How do you want to work this? We'll blitz this through and uh, I want to get to a rant I have at the <laughs> end of it. So for I'm the week. Like, keeping it all in, in like, I just want to yeah, rant out. Just you don't. Like, it's this is really <laughs> bad for your health. I mean, I woke up to Twitter this morning and it was just, ugh. so for the week of uh, October 24. I believe this is uh, all the news that has fit the podcast. And we did get to see uh, a little preview of sorts for the OnePlus 5T that we're expecting out soon. Uh, obviously, we have an event queued up, at least in India, for sometime in November. But the Oppo R11s was pre announced in China today with uh, 4 gigabytes of RAM, uh, Snapdragon uh, 835, I believe, is the question here, and also 660. Thank you. And uh, 64 gigabyte of storage. Also, with that two by one display that everyone's been talking about, spreading over into Oppo and into perhaps OnePlus dual cameras at the back and more. We'll expect to hear more from Oppo soon enough. In the meantime, still waiting on that OnePlus. Andromeda, do you remember the, Marcus, um, <laughs> the Microsoft Courier? From we sure do. Years ago, yeah, with we that do. folding notebook display and two screens, and it's totally not like the Kios or Echo because that's a bigger thing. I mean, it's 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 huge. And okay, so uh, basically, there's this device. Very vague details. Uh, just it's the same form factor. We would hope that, as opposed to 2009, we would get, I guess, lesser bezels. Uh, Microsoft. Ink working with that uh, Surface uh, there. Hopefully, it's a Surface Note or Surface Journal or something like that. And uh, it's targeted towards 2018. We have, we might be talking about uh, a, a Snapdragon ish uh, deal here because Windows 10 on ARM has been a big development in the past uh, year or so. Plus, uh, let's talk about LG getting a smattering of uh, phones onto Amazon Circuit. It's a prime exclusive program where you have ads on the lock screen and suggestions throughout the whole interface of Android. And if you want to get, say, 50, 70 bucks on those phones, you can partake in the prime exclusive phones. They'll be on the new, uh, just added to the program, G6, G6 Plus, uh, the Q6, and the X Charge. Have at that. We have uh, some fish to talk about. One fish, two fish, albacore, uh, blue line, and uh, uh, the crosshatch? Is that it, what we're talking about here? Pixel 3. The one reading the article is, is you've got a lot of questions sounding in your voice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was trying. I was trying to get like a Doctor Seuss thing going oh, on there. I was, yeah, like, I, got you. I was like, oh, oh wonderment and excitement <laughs> and all that. Well, but and, oh yeah, we'll, we'll. I'll save it. I'll save it. We've got it. We will talk about the stories. Sorry, I'm gonna shut up. Go ahead, uh, Jules. Sorry. Wahoo to you. <laughs> <laughs> so that so uh, those three devices uh, are what we're talking about for potential Pixel Three phones. There's also uh, uh, something that was referencing to a last year phone. And that would be the code name Wahoo, although we don't know if that will end up coming up in uh, 2018. So we'll talk about that once we get to it. Verizon is asking its customers that if it, they want 4K video, they're going to have to pay $10 more per month. And that is the very complicated Verizon Unlimited plan situation going on because when they launched Verizon Unlimited, it was just one plan with the full unlimited streaming initially before they started capping it off to. And then they split it up into two plans Go Unlimited, which is 480p, and then Beyond Unlimited, which is 720p, which is even worse. So there's a whole bunch of uh, this complication. And then, better yet, you can pay more, you can line Verizon's pockets and get 4K streaming. Uh, Verizon has made the case that it basically doesn't really benefit those customers who have phones quality, and there are only so few of them out there. But it's still worth something to some people that they get at least 1080p 
quad hd perhaps mobile streaming who knows let's talk about steven wozniak he was the former wise was was he uh co-founding apple and also defounding the whole iphone x thing because he's typically a pretty uh, a fr- pretty close first adapter of new iPhones. And he said to CNBC that he's just going to keep his iPhone 8 for the time being. Uh, of the iPhone X he, uh, 10, he told uh, them, I'm just worried about what it provides me. I'd rather that one, and I'm happy with my iPhone, which is the same as the iPhone 7, which is the same as the iPhone 6 to me. So I'm doing pretty well. Those are his words, um, and apparently uh, he's going to stick to them at least through the opening period of iPhone X, uh, iPhone 10 pre-orders. So uh, we'll look to see what happens with that. And then there is uh, the big Bloomberg story this week that uh, the Face ID component uh, manufacturers have low. Uh, Apple has lowered the accuracy specification for that, so that manufacturers can send more of them over to get to finished iPhone units. Uh, That accuracy spec, by the way, they mentioned it, it was a a million to one as opposed to Tidy's 50,000 to one. Uh, I believe that the speculative number or the like the ballpark number that people have been tossing around would be in the hundred thousands area to one still pretty good, but it's a compromise nonetheless. And Apple responded to that reported rumored compromise by saying that Bloom, uh, Bloomberg's claim that Apple has reduced the accuracy spec for Face ID uh, is completely false. And we expect Face ID to be the new gold standard for facial authentication. So um, definitely when we're talking about supply, um, this has been the component that has been causing the most trouble for Apple. And it's part of why we're seeing uh, backups even f- 12 hours from the start of pre-orders at 3 a.m. Eastern, 12 uh, Pacific, uh, to six weeks of shipping. Now, that with uh, the iPhone 7, the jet black finish, that was a pretty hot item in the 128 and 256 uh, gigabyte uh, storage models. Those were waiting at least eight weeks all the way to November from uh, pre-order time. So mm-hmm. it's not as bad as that, but just give it a few more hours, maybe even a day or so. And uh, we might be talking about a different situation, which leads me into what I've been talking about this morning with uh, Michael Fisher, Mr. Mobile, and uh, Andy Inatko, pretty uh, Chicago Tribune, I-, I believe, was he from? Yes. Well, he's. Yeah. I don't know Jules. <laughs> and and Nak- Naka has made his name for uh, his thoughts on uh, Apple. And in any case, he uh, said in a tweet this morning that an environment where a consumer feels lucky to get an iPhone 10 or a Nintendo Classic or any product is toxic to dignity and the soul. Michael Fisher retweets that and then adds his own commentary where he says an environment where people are made to feel ashamed for being passionate about something that excites them is worse i mean i get it we're all victims of consumerism we've lost sight of what's important in life the corporations have won whatever but i spent way too many years taking crap from people who don't understand my love of tech and willingness to spend money on it like what they like and I was kind of ticked off about the whole situation because it's not just about one person. It's not just about the persecution of tech geeks, which, hello. (laughs) Uh, But it's uh, it's more about the market and what it wants and what it needs out of Apple. Apple, uh, its CEO, Tim Cook, went on America's most popular morning uh, morning show, Good Morning America, to sell people on the iPhone 10. You wouldn't think that this $999 value-priced phone, his words, not mine, would appeal to the mass market, to the big, yeah, it's still a bargain. And, but bank analysts have said that this is gonna be the phone for Apple, that this will trigger a so-called super cycle, 
where people who have held on to their iPhone 4, 4S, 5, 5S, all those, to this newest, this most changiest <laughs> iPhone in quite some time. And you heard it from, it was. iPhone 8, iPhone 7, iPhone 6, they're all the same. So when we're contrasting that situation here, and you think about what quarter we're coming into, it's the holiday quarter, and it's the busiest by far for upgrades, for uh, the exchanges and all that. And you see the supply strain from that iPhone, uh, from that uh, Face ID component. You're going to be wondering, does it really suck? Does Do people have to be lucky in order to wake up at 3 a.m. or do whatever it takes to get to 3 a.m.? To just get something that they would consider is a mission critical device that runs their daily lives and you know it's nice to have this changey thing and you know instead of the iphone 8 where they kind of it's it's okay it's all right but it leads to more of a malaise just by owning it and going through the the same old same old um you know maybe maybe it could be we could be leading into that uh and I guess. Well, what do you think? I mean, it's well. I, it, I guess it's first of all, what, what what I what I would just what I would just kind of question. I, well, you you seem to have some really strong feelings on this exchange between two people talking. I think talking through each other, uh, sort of addressing different aspects okay. of tech and consumerism. And why why did you feel like you had such a strong reaction to this exchange? Because I feel like we're ignoring the bigger questions around what the iphone 10 is to mm -hmm. not only tech geek, because tech geeks have always been on that front edge and there's always been that product that has surrounded uh, them it's always right. been a niche uh and well, everyone else had yeah, the main I, product I, I... but this is being marketed as a main product to people to yeah, I, average I guess, joke. I guess I guess my feeling would be I, I I don't I don't see or I don't understand the individual who's going to get upset with Apple for a marketing or a strategy that they've employed since the very inception of the iPhone. Everything about the the iPhone has kind of been built up on a notion of exclusivity and premium consumer uh, consumer experience. So this is sort of par for the course um i mean to to michael fisher's comment there i mean yeah there are going to be people who are genuinely excited about getting this new phone but apple has always apple in the mobile strategy has always been consumer facing not tech geek facing they they don't really care if tech geeks are on board because that's not their bread and butter and that's not where any company makes makes their money it's can you cross over into some sort of mainstream lifestyle commentary and you know i I don't know that I'd put it so de derisively as uh, I forget the the first guy who you mentioned tweeting, oh, this is such a sad day for consumerism when this is literally the main way to launch a premium product is to make it feel like it's exclusive. You can't make the regular iPhone feel exclusive because it is very largely the same phone we've had since the iPhone 6. So this goes hand in hand with Apple probably has bitten off more than they can chew just for manufacturing the device. And it really just plays into the narrative that this is going to be an ultra luxury premium experience that not everyone gets to have right at the very beginning, right at launch. And it's going to end up making it even more desirable. This is all marketing. This is all, you know, PR. Though, We've seen them do this they don't talk so about often. Like that. Yeah. But we've seen them do this so often that it's it shouldn't be a surprise and we shouldn't take it as a shock should we be having conversations with consumers about like how their dollars and entertainment dollars and their their lifestyle dollars can be better spent I mean, we're here I to mean, have you, those conversations you but... vote with your wallet basically because if you're going for the iphone 8 anyways then it's going to continue it's going to sustain that kind of um uh just conservative uh upgrade moment motion and it's not going to allow, we've seen all these new concepts from Moto with the modular smartphone and when people are I, not I, allowed I to jump away from it, when people are not allowed to jump away from their current platform right. and do all that when they're locked in, regardless, you know, we don't have a contract anymore, but we have these two-year agreements. None. 
yeah, it's leasing leasing a phone instead of owning a phone. Right. But but a bit I, I think the point that I would I would sort of wrap my my feelings on this story up with are I feel that the thousand dollar iPhone era is only going to accelerate general consumers getting off of the smartphone excitement bandwagon. I I I really feel like you know, and 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 to a large degree, this also kind of goes for Note Eight and every other ultra premium smartphone out there, where um, the phone is a commodity, the phone is a necessity, but that doesn't mean you need to buy the most expensive one to get something that's going to achieve everything you need it to do. And I think yeah, it's just going to. So I'll give you a unique perspective from here. So yeah. you want to be knowing about Xiaomi, right? So they hold yeah. flash sales, uh, flash sales all the time. It, there's uh, that's their own business model, right? So they have like less number of stocks, and then they hold flash sales where you have to be really quick and lucky to get the phones, right? So um, that's the same case with the iPhone X in the US. Like you, know, you have pre-orders and you have to like mm -hmm. get up early and get those pre-orders in, and then uh, Xiaomi also gives out. F codes, which is like friend code, which uh, literally just means like the invite system from the OnePlus. You remember that? Like OnePlus One, you needed invite yeah, to purchase yeah. the phone. So yeah, Xiaomi also gives out like F codes to buy the devices. And it kind of gives you a feeling that, oh, this phone is premium in some sorts, that there's a shortage of those phones and you need to buy them. Yeah, I, I understand. Uh, I understand the, they're a market leader, but I don't think by much because they're, they're I mean, they're, they've been upsurging since uh, when they debuted in the market in 2014, but they still have a lot of competition from Samsung and Motorola and all that. So, right. But, but I mean, think we've also seen these, these other strategies employed in other ways too. I, I mean, like it, not, obviously not a market leader, but look at how much we used to trash OnePlus for their lottery system where it wasn't even just, could you get your presale? And it was, you got a ticket for the, you know the raffle of being able to buy the phone and i i, I guess like if, if we're really gonna bemoan the situation i think it's um just a little bit disingenuous from someone in, in traditional media to be complaining about this kind of consumerism when literally it's newspapers and tv that are the main aspects of reinforcing this kind of consumer relationship like I'll have conversations. I'm going to be on a Good Day LA. It's a local Fox affiliate for the greater Los Angeles area in a couple of weeks to talk about unlocked phones. And the producer who's working that segment was telling me, like, it's actually really difficult to do a segment like that because it doesn't have an iPhone in it. You know, so it's this traditional media mentality that's reinforcing why consumers find this so exciting. Um, you know, iPhone 8 launch day, and it was kind of a shock that no one was out lining up for these iPhones and it caught news departments, local news agencies by surprise because that used to be a major aspect of their coverage for an iPhone launch. But you would never see that for an HTC launch, for an LG launch, for a Samsung launch. And so it's sort of a never ending cycle of consumers respond to iPhone stories. Let's do iPhone stories. Oh, they're not responding to LG stories. Let's not do LG stories. And it, it's they they are complicit in this conversation as well. I, I I again I don't know the work of this gentleman who's complaining about the dignity of consumers. Um, but this is this is why we have these kinds of conversations. I think we need to move on. We've got so many other news uh, items to talk about, and I'd really like to bring Shaman more into these conversations. So uh, let's let's jump into uh, just immediately. Um, I, I want to talk Pixel. about. Well, yeah. Well, do we want to talk about the Pixel? We haven't even finished our Pixel review. And we're talking <laughs> all, about Pixel 3. I was talking about the future, right? Sh Shimon, yeah. have, have, you, have, you, have yeah. you gotten the handle of Pixel 2 now that it's already crazy obsolete and we're going to talk about the Pixel 3 and how everyone should buy that phone instead? No, like, I'm literally waiting to get my hands on the Pixel 2 or Pixel 2 XL. I'm literally waiting like, hey, come on, it's time. Oh, come on. Yeah, perfect, yeah, yeah. dude. Perfect. I'm, I'm shoving this in his face right now. I'm sorry. Wow, that's that's dirty. Apologies. <laughs> oh, God. But only because I had to pay for it myself, and it's Project 5. So, so I mean, we're, we're talking, I mean, this this is nice to actually have your perspective on, on the podcast, though, Shaman, in that there are certain phones, like, for example, I feel this kind of ennui when Huawei launches a phone, and it takes it a lot longer to make it to the United States than its in initial launch partners. Here, we're showing off 
the Google phone, you know, the company that makes Android. This is the hardware that they want to display their forward facing software technologies on. And do you have an idea of when the phone's going to be available in your area yet? Uh, Pixel? Yeah, on, on the Pixel and the Pixel XL. Yes, I do have a specific date. If I recall correctly, the Pixel 2 is coming on 5th of November, and then Pixel 2 XL is coming on 15th of November. Yikes. If I recall correctly, yeah. So that's so, the timeline. So when, when, you're looking, when you're looking at that kind of timeline, and obviously from there, all of the early reviews are going to be out in, in more Western markets, what does that do for the coverage locally or for the fan base that you're writing for? Does that does that seem to help build anticipation for the phone launch, or does it does it kind of halt? You know, like we're we're not getting the of, perspective, so it, it's less exciting by the time you guys finally get it. Yeah, so it's kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, on the one hand, some people are like, "Okay, come on, if a product launches uh, outside of India, so it has to be on the same page. Like, um, companies should seed those devices to Indian, you know, reviewers also." But then um, it's kind of a phased view. Like some people in India won't be watching content from people outside India. So once the content starts rolling in India, then they start watching it. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. Just one comparison. And, well, and specifically for the Pixel, do you think that this is emboldening like Google's strategy here? Or do you think that this is some, somewhere where they're vulnerable against more local competition? Yeah. like. Um, they still like they launched it kind of early. Like um, last year, it, it took them like about a month or so to bring it over here in India. But this time, like Pixel Two launch party was literally held today. Like the party is still going on <laughs> in somewhere in Delhi. <laughs> so, the party is still going on. So yeah, they launched it officially today. But yeah, it will be available from November. The aforementioned dates. Do you think that local plants will uh, be making uh, Pixel 2 units because we did see the, them making them for the original Pixel? Uh, I'm not too sure. I'll have to check with my friends who have an Indian, legit Indian uh, retail unit. I'll have to check. It's because we like to see these dates moved up just a little bit so that, I mean, even with localization, it'd still be nice to have somewhere closer to a simultaneous launch going on around right. the world. I mean, and this more so, you know, uh, there has been like some discrepancies, uh, some differences in the package contents. If you remember, the US Pixel doesn't have earphones. The Indian one does. But I'm not too sure if that's, <laughs> yeah. the, if that's the same case with the Pixel 2. I'm not too sure about that. I, I, I'll be really curious to see if that plays out because I don't know that Google has any strategy for a data port set of earbuds unless they're going to include... 3.5 millimeter headphones <laughs> with your adapter. To... That'd be really odd. It'd just be a slightly bigger box. That's all. Come on. No, I think it would be hilarious. Like again, <laughs> the the headphone jack is obsolete, but you still need one. You know, <laughs> like, it's it's such a mixed message right now. Uh, I want to shift gears over into Microsoft Andromeda dual screen tablets. I feel we're back on another trend where we're trying to get consumers excited about mobile computing. And there's this science fiction idea of the device that I hold up and then stretch. And now I have a super big display. Uh, you know, ZTE put out their, their Axon. Axon app. Yeah. I still have my, my Kyocera Echo on the table so that, you know, I can talk about dual screen. Well, that was a nice meaty sound. Um, wow. Yeah, nice. got this really over-engineered um, hinge oh system, God. which I'm sure I'm sure would have lasted <laughs> for the life of this phone. Um, ASMR maniacs are just going crazy. Right I, now. Okay, so I'm sorry, I got to change it real quick. <laughs> no, this this came in a box from Michael Fisher when I joined the Pocket Now team, and I basically got like a ton of his hand-me-downs, and this phone was pristine, like it had not been touched or used at all just to show you oh. how much how much confidence and how much faith we had in kyocera's experiment there but i digress um so again i'm, I'm we're, we're talking about these companies that are going to be coming out we're pretty confident samsung will probably launch some kind of folding screen device we saw an amazing concept piece by lenovo a foldable phone that did the same thing 
Yeah, which they had yeah, like a bracelet also, sort of thing. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and that the, the screen actually kind of folded around yeah. so that you, you it wasn't just two screens sort of stuck together. I but also in like the intermediate level, the yoga book, which had yoga that book. kind of semi screen too. Which I've been true. I've been using a lot. In fact, on episode two of the New Egg Now live broadcasts, that's actually the the <laughs> system that I'm using for all my show notes is my uh, is my uh, Lenovo yoga book um, because I really like that thing. I don't love the keyboard, but um, <laughs> so we've got we've got all of these sort of various experiments coming out, which which look and 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 feel exciting, but do they really address what I what I think consumers are are needing in a daily mobility device? Is this really going to be the next phase of mobile hardware, or is this going to be just like another one of those fads that we kind of walk through before we settle down and say like, you know, people didn't really need this stuff. And now we're all going to go into neural link interfaces anyway. So the phone's pretty much dead. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> we're still a few years from neural link interfaces and we sort of need I mean, at least two, at least two years away from <laughs> like, especially yeah. when we're in the age of butterfly switches, as opposed to the standard switches on the MacBooks where, you're not getting as much travel or you're not even getting the sensation that you would like to get anyways from just typing. So why not right. just go all the way and uh, try your best at haptics next time? So with that, uh, you can, uh, they've uh, apples started with the touch bar too, uh, using a little, little secondary tasks on that bar. Uh, it's just trying to see how much stuff and into one screen and how much um display it's like control yeah. like or your display content whatever in another screen just like the um nintendo 3ds that was a yeah that's that was a yeah well but but shaman i mean are your readers or your viewers like looking at their phones and going oh but if only i could double my screen size for a couple times throughout my day when i need a mini tablet is that something that you think you know no i don't familiar? think so it's like I uh, know. So it's like people are already moving towards tablets. Like 5.5 inches is like the hottest screen mm -hmm. size right now. Mm -hmm. So everybody's like, okay, I'm fine with the tablet. But I don't think that people are really, you know, looking into something like a bigger display, like even more bigger display, or even folding displays for that matter. I don't think there's a market for it right now, until unless someone else like literally barges through with uh, a slew of products and say like, hey, look, our products, you can fold them. <laughs> and then they will be enticed, like, wow. Well, you mean until something. Apple does it, and then everyone's going to want it, and then that'll be yeah. the wink, most wink. thing. <laughs> so, or someone just goes in and says, it slices, it dices, and it also hangs in, Until up. my phone makes me julienne fries, I'm not going to be happy. But, uh, but Shimon, I, I was curious, like, what is the tablet market looking like in India right now? Is is this a computing solution that, that took off, or is it still more the phone and traditional computer solution for a lot of consumers there? It's totally binary right now. Either you get an iPad or you don't, or you just get a tablet instead. Mm. A tablet market is like totally dead now. So is, there, is, almost is there like any opportunity for, for like, a, like a Chromebook or something in that space? Uh, Chromebook are almost like negligible over here. Totally. No. <laughs> yeah, this, this is a Chrome, special guy. I mean... When we're talking about education sector, because that's the biggest thing for tablet likes and uh, cheap laptops, it was it's between the Chromebook, which is actually gaining in popularity despite here some in the issues US. recently. Yeah. Here in the U.S. at least, and uh, you know, and as opposed to iPads, but worldwide, I would assume that people are more accustomed to uh, iPads for educational purposes, anyways. More more than that, you know, the main um, factor for people over here is like. For Chromebooks, if you don't have access to the internet, you can't do much on yeah. Chromebooks. So you're, mm. you're like you're out of options. Can't do so much that's why people are like. <laughs> that makes well, hopefully sense. maybe Android um, apps. I don't know. Ugh. Android. So so in, in I, I guess like like just to kind of wrap up in this this notion that we're gonna get like a courier tablet or something like this. Do you think that there would be, Shaman, do you think that there would be an opportunity in India for Microsoft to make more headway showcasing a more fluid or more modular version of Windows? 
you know, the ability to pare it down into a simpler, more streamlined workflow, the ability to have like a full desktop OS for the products that that needs to work on? Or do you think that the mobility market has kind of taken over for most people's computing needs? Yeah, that, that's very interesting because uh, Microsoft is really lacking uh, in the uh, department that they're really slow in launching products over here. So even mm -hmm. Surface is like a generation behind in India. Yeah, and not, not not even on Surface. Even the Xbox One S was launched a week ago. Oh in wow! India. Okay, can you imagine that? Like wow, <laughs> so late. <laughs> Uh, I don't even want to get but especially for entertainment one. dollars. If there's anything that can kind of cross all regions and all cultures, it's like I won't play games. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, coming back to the topic, um, I don't think they will be able to, you know, diversify into India with all those mobility things because smartphones have really taken over here, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't see people, you know, going to take. I mean, they're going to carry another device just for the mobility purposes. Right. If they want, they can carry a MacBook or their laptop. I don't see them carrying a tablet anytime soon. Gotcha. What? what? <laughs> so I, I was just gonna say sad trombone. Um, I wanna, <laughs> I, I wanna loosely before we get, we do need to to hit our sponsor block. Before we do that though, I wanna wrap up with the the Oppo. Um, I uh, I actually got to go and visit uh, um, Oppo's manufacturing for the R11. Uh, and it was right before the OnePlus 5 had been released. So I'm feeling pretty confident we're going to see that same divide on the R11S versus the 5T or whatever OnePlus is going to call their next uh, all-screen phone. And even down yeah. to the little particulars, like the Qualcomm 660 in the R11, you know, moving over to the Qualcomm 835 for the uh, the OnePlus I variant. See. What what is what is Oppo's uh, Oppo's position? Uh, in India, I have to believe that they're a, a much higher profile brand than they're considered here in the United States. Yeah, true. So they have like deep pockets. So they're like mm -hmm. everywhere marketing over here and there. They're even like sponsoring like cricket teams and, you know, shows like that. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, the, the presence is strong over here. Yeah, the apple to, green is just all over the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> so, so is this is this a product because you know here in the United States we get into these visceral debates as to like what's a flagship phone what's a mid ranger I usually rely on price you know if something is a thousand dollars well that's the top of the market and if something's five hundred that's literally half so that's in the mid range um, <laughs> so with with something like the R eleven you know Oppo's billing it as as one of their sort of selfie expert phones it brings um. It, it it brings, I think, a nice build quality, if maybe a little too iPhone-y in some respects. But yeah, we look at things like the chipset and the RAM and the storage. Are those conversations that factor into what consumers spend over in your market? Or, does, I mean, would they look at the R11 and say, well, that's a flagship phone from Oppo? Or do they have the same kinds of conversations where it's sort of mid-pack, but we don't get the CPU or we don't get this this storage? Okay, so here's where things get very, very interesting. So <clears throat> the whole smartphone market is divided into three sections. One is like ultra low budget phones, mm -hmm. which is captured by Xiaomi, which would be like uh, about 10,000 rupees. Okay. Okay, and then, uh, then comes the mid range, where again, Xiaomi and Motorola are there with about uh, 15 to 20,000 rupees. And then straight in the uh, high end market, oh. OnePlus is there with their, uh, OnePlus 5 at 33,000 rupees, 33 to 37,000 rupees, right? So whichever flagship phone crosses the price of uh, OnePlus 5 is deemed as overpriced. Like even Nokia 8, when it was launched, it was launched at 36 triple nine. So literally 37,000 rupees, almost matching the price of OnePlus 5. Mm. So okay. that, so Nokia, uh, Nokia 8 didn't get scrutinized for the price, but let it be like some other phone, um, Galaxy Note 8 or the HTC 11 and LG G6, they were they were deemed expensive, overpriced because they were like 67,000 rupees, 78,000 rupees. That was expensive, right? And, and Pixel 2, even that is pretty expensive. I don't recall the correct price, but it's upwards of 35,000 rupees or something like that. So, so those imports get hit really hard. So the premium market, I mean, I'm sorry, and I'm trying to do these conversions in real time for our audience too, just because yeah. I, I, I can't convert rupees yeah. to dollars in my brain. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but so you're, you're saying like the premium market over there at around 30 to 35,000 rupees is, uh, 
um, that that's kind of considered the high end of where people. Uh, no, no, the, no. The thing is that um, since OnePlus Five has like literally the high end specs and they price it so closely, like um, mm -hmm. close to thirty to forty thousand rupees bracket. So okay. whichever phone crosses that price mark, everybody deems it as overpriced. Gotcha. Okay, I understand. So, okay. so there's a, a mental block between. Has one like, five has like been that standard bearer? Because I knew I know there was they they had a big ad during the cricket bash and uh, it was kind of cross. They they tend to cause a little controversy, whatever they do. But it's <laughs> like from what, how you put it, it seems like this is the standard now. Yeah. So you that's other people get along because uh, it's a very price sensitive market. So people literally. They have like two options, specs and price, and they have to find a middle ground between those two. So Xiaomi so, nails it. Nobody can beat Xiaomi in uh, offering the specs for their price. I mean, I, I still don't know how they make money. <laughs> it's yeah. it's very surprising how they make money. But yeah, they offer really good specs for the price. So just for our audience, somewhere around 35,000 rupees is, uh, is about 540 uh, American dollars, which I mean, that's that's sort of feels like it's in keeping with OnePlus's strategy here, maybe a little on the high end. But um, what were you saying that the Pixel was probably going to go for? Uh, yeah, I'm just checking out the press release as we talk. <laughs> let, let me search for the exact price. Yeah, so Pixel Two, uh, 64 GB version is priced at 61,000 rupees. Ooh. Oh wow! The 120, yes, right. and the 128 GB version is priced at 70,000 rupees. Yeah, not even the XL. Yeah, and so, the it, XL, so you're not joking. I mean, you're, you're saying it's literally twice the price of a OnePlus yes. 5. So people are like, why not? I mean, I'll just buy OnePlus 5. If it breaks, I can buy another one for the same price. <laughs> 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 or you like just right at top, I'm just going to buy two and I'll have a backup. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I, yeah. I, I, then, I hate, know, I hate being the know, American the consumer. The fact is, like um, this, this all of this discussion is for Android phones. But if you go for the iPhone market, people will buy crazy. Like they don't see any price barrier or anything. They will just mm. buy it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. obviously that kind of works for us here in the United States too. Yeah. I, I just pulled up. I, I just pulled up the press release. The the Pixel Two XL 128 gigabyte variant in India is the equivalent of a one thousand two hundred and seventy dollar. Phone. Oh, oh boy! So that Pixel Two XL, one twenty eight GB version costs eighty two thousand rupees. Yeah, that's so, a lot. Yeah, that is a lot. I'm trying to, I'm trying to see. Like, I'm looking at the iPhone ten for the India market, and it's not showing me anything. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so if I recall correctly, it uh, it costs ninety three thousand rupees or ninety seven. If I'm for oh wrong. for the iPhone ten. Yeah, iPhone ten. Yeah, that's, not so another pricey phone. that's that's fifteen hundred bucks. <laughs> so yeah. I mean, it's it's not much of a premium, but it's still a fifty percent premium. <laughs> it's not much of a premium. Not, it's just a fifty percent premium. I need you to understand what you just said there, Jules. <laughs> and on that note, because we gotta we gotta pay some bills ourselves, we should probably jump into our sponsor break here real quick before we uh, dive into the mailbag. <laughs> Uh, this week's episode of the Pocket Now Weekly and its rambling discussion through the exchange rates in Indian and uh, U.S. Uh, currencies uh, is brought to you by App River. I got, I'm going to go to my script here because this is going to be a train wreck if I don't. Uh, the most successful business owners out there are people who enjoy what they're doing. More than just enjoy it, whatever their thing is, they love it. But here's what they don't love. When they have to stop doing what makes them money to handle something that does not make them money, especially when it comes to email. And that's one reason why AppRiver shines. AppRiver keeps your inbox free from spam and viruses. So you don't have to worry about all that junk cluttering up your day. If you're running your own email servers, protect them with AppRiver. And if you're tired of that headache, just sign up for a hosted exchange or Office 365 and get your email from the cloud where AppRiver can also keep you protected. This is also kind of hitting a little close to home because uh, my wife did fall for one of those. It looks like a contact in my address book, send you a link, clicking on the link. Oh no, that's bad. And her email was compromised recently and she's going to be kind of embarrassed that I just shared that story. 
Here's the best part. You can call App River anytime, night or day, and you'll talk to a real live US-based company employee, somebody who's trained to take care of your issue and lets you get back to doing what you love. Visit appriver.com slash weekly and try any of their services free for 30 days. That's A-P-P-R-I-V-E-R.com slash weekly. I try their services for free for a month, and we thank them for supporting the Pocket Now Weekly. Indeed we do. And we also thank our listeners for listening to the Pocket Now Weekly and every so often sending us mail. Hello. Yeah, we've got some good ones. Yeah, let's, uh, you want to just dive right in and just go through the... Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, I, like, I, I was <laughs> expecting the, 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 the audio cue, the chime, you know, like, we don't do that anymore. So let's, <laughs> let's jump in. Hold on, hold on. That's not a good email transition. I, let's not do that oh, ever that's, again. That's the only thing no. I have. Shimon, I apologize for <laughs> Jules' slight whistle. Um, so starting off, uh, right at the top of our list, this is from Jesse Trujillo. Um, and Jesse's asking about sort of the state of reviews and reviewers. What do you guys think about reviewers and the media somewhat focusing more on what companies don't do versus what they choose to do when it comes to the features and design choices that are made in, in any given device. An example would be choosing to give a phone a better camera, but the trade-off that it means there will also be a small bump on the back. Whereas that bump could be avoided altogether, but it would mean a lesser camera would have to be decided upon. It almost feels like these companies can't win because no matter what they do, no one is ever really happy. And the same might be argued about a phone's thickness, its battery size, just things in general like that. Would love to hear your thoughts and opinions. Thanks, guys. Love the podcast. Thanks, Jesse. And actually, Shimon, let me uh, let me jump in right there because, you know, we, we see some sort of... Uh, you know, like we we're talking about Oppo and OnePlus, and that was something we criticized, camera bulge on the back of the OnePlus yeah. 5. What do you what do you think about the commentary that surrounds things like those kinds of design choices? So, you know, um, there was a sudden influx of um, smartphone camera bumps recently. So now like people have gotten used to it. Like, OK, you have to accept that a phone in 2017 will have a camera bump. And it was kind of surprising, like how Pixel 1 didn't have a camera bump because it had a wedge kind of design because it was thick at the uh, top and the top, thin yeah, at the yeah. bottom. So too, I'm, I'm like, wow, what happened? <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think there's a logical reason for that because in the Pixel 1, if you drop your phone, the whole visor on the back will crack and that costs about 12,000 rupees to repair it and it's pretty costly. So if you drop your Pixel 2, only the camera lens would crack and not the visor. That's my logic. <laughs> okay. but, but I mean, so outside of just like, you know, specifically on the Pixel 2, I think that there's this general, uh, there's this general feeling that you go to a certain reviewer and you have an expectation that they're, they're personally going to prefer something as their favorite daily driver and that all other devices seem to be judged against that phone. Like you're not really reviewing the Sony Xperia XZ1C, you're telling people why the Sony Xperia XZ1C isn't like your favorite phone, the LG G6. You know what I mean? And so how do you think that commentary sort of influences consumers? Or do you think it's just a byproduct of consumers looking for validation on what they already like? Yeah, that's the thing. Uh, I would go with the latter. Because each and every consumer has his own um, thought process and his own uh, opinions about devices. So he kind of correlates with each and every content creator, like how the content is provided to him. So he just correlates with the content. Well, and Jules, I mean, like you can jump in too because you're totally a Pixel fanboy now. Like everything else <laughs> is crap now that you have your Pixel 2. Fanboy. Yeah, big <laughs> Well, time. yeah. I apologize. Uh, I, I, Jules' commentary is going to get super Pixel super fast here. Oh, okay, well, in that case, uh, I love the speed, and that's pretty much it. Good day, good day, sir. In good day. So back to just in in regards to Jesse's question here. I mean the the battery question has always been the biggest one. Everyone has been talking. Oh, it should be just, just we can take an eight millimeter thick kind of thing, and that's after we've been using even like five millimeter devices, six millimeter devices for the longest <laughs> time, even seven millimeters, like just that extra bit, I feel like is going like hard to adjust to, 
but people will like if there's no good reason for it people will kind of just itch at it and not really want to take the dive initially i think that's that's how i feel in terms of that debate in terms of other omission negative space kind of stuff going on you remember how it, was, it was a trend uh, way back in like 2014, 15, where like every OEM was going towards thinner and thinner phones. Even Geo launched a phone which was like 5.1 mm thick, or I would say yeah. 5.1 mm thin, <laughs> not thick. <laughs> mm. That was the uh, was it the Oppo R3 or five or something like there that. Multiple smartphones at once. Multiple. Oh Jesus, yeah. Gosh, but I'm trying to remember, a, like, what was, that was the, a horrible, yeah. the Moto Z? Because that was a, another, like, ridiculously thin. Mo that was also a 5, I think. Moto Z. Let's look that I'm up. I'm going to look at it. Uh, right. but, Give Ricky yeah, uh, as a plug. Because I'm going to put it up on GSM. <laughs> GSM Arena. Yeah, 5.2. Uh, yeah, but, a 5.2 millimeter 5 .2. thick phone. Yeah, but it's just, I mean in terms of other features that might or might not go sometimes we, we talk about the like the fingerprint sensor it's it should be it should be on the back or the front or should it exist at all in terms of you know getting a, a facial recognition there oh, there no. are all these other <laughs> device yeah but i think this, this is all like kind of wrapped up in a commentary though and i think what jesse is trying to get at is I mean, think about how many times each of us have written an article or produced a video where someone leaves this comment, which I think is genuinely well-intentioned. Like, oh, you're talking about this phone. I would totally buy this phone if it had a different screen and the headphone jack was better and it had the camera from the Lumia 1020. Well, then don't was, buy this phone. <laughs> it, was, it was super thin and it had three-day battery life and I only had to spend $50 and a half a ham sandwich to buy it. You know, then I would totally buy this phone. And you're like, you've just described something which is exactly not this phone. It doesn't but even it, exist. In it really the world. feels like people people have an idea of their winning team in mind, and then they'll go back. You know, so that's an emotional thing. That's an emotional yeah. attachment to a brand yeah. or a product. And then, and then they'll then crawl back into what they really need <laughs> to join the conversation. They'll sort of rationalize after the fact, and they'll say. Yeah. Oh, you know, take the L Samsung. You needed to do this, this, and this, and this to get my money. But had Samsung done that, 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 and that, you still would have found some reason to buy your preferred brand over the Samsung. And at the it, end of the day, you just you have a purchase decision to make. And they're not in the business of making just you happy. They're making, it's like a whole bunch of people happy. Talk about millions of people, at least <laughs> fairly happy for the next couple of years. Right, but that's also, why I, the next see, one. that's also why I think we see a certain flavor of conversation when we're talking about the review space as well. Like, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I've been guilty of this on some of my reviews too, where if you call something a review and more than like 5% of that piece of media is comparing that device against another device, you really haven't shot a review. You've, you've produced a comparison Absolutely. and you're telling someone why another product is better as opposed to judging the reviewed product on its own merits. And that's a really difficult line to walk, but I think it gets reinforced when then the audience responds and you know you can look at some of these some tech blogs where you, you could build a channel that's literally just iPhone, right? You yeah. can't build a channel that's literally just LG. Yeah, you know yeah. you can't, you can't really. survive on that. And so that no. sort of reinforces. It's kind of like I was saying with local news here. It kind of reinforces because I need the clicks, I need the eyeballs, I need the comments, I need the shares, and I will get them with LG, and I will get them significantly more if I just cover Samsung. That could be also, part, but Apple also makes it, knows how to make something work out because they have the events, they have the shows and LG knowing its place doesn't. So chicken right, or the that's egg. Also, that's also me. a big part of the problem is like, I think any company can play the media game. I, it, it's really only Apple and Samsung. And now Google, I would say Google is actually joining yeah. the conversation with some, some savvy advertising. They got they got yeah, yeah, you can actually see, I mean, like, again, you've got to go to where the people are. And if you don't have boots on the ground and yeah. signs and TV ads and yeah. radio ads, then you don't exist. But let's move on to the next email here. And thank you, Jesse, for sending that in. Um, this is from Timothy, Timothy Bayer. 
And uh, this is a little bit longer. I'm going to try and blitz through this. I might cut part of this email. I'm doing this in real time. It's live. Ha -ha. Um, <laughs> thank you for what you do. I find the information very informative. Like most of us, I depend heavily on a smartphone. I am physically disabled. I'm a physically disabled consumer who is not interested as much in cutting edge features and specifications as I am in ruggedness and durability. As a result, I am considering buying the Kyocera DuraForce Pro on Verizon. It came out near the end of last year. I wanted to get the opinion of the team in regards to this device. Uh, he goes on to say he's looked at YouTube reviews. Uh, a lot of people have seemed fairly positive on this phone. Uh, we did not, unfortunately, get to cover it on Pocket now. But um, uh, da, 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 da. oh, uh, finally, I ver oh, and he's talking about some of our EFA coverage too. We don't need to get into that. But um, so the Kyocera DuraForce Pro, uh, not a high end or high spec phone. And it, not a high-end or high, high spec phone for its initial release last year. Um, what do you think, Jules? Is this something that might make for a good fit for someone at the end of 2017 moving into 2018? Yeah, in terms of being able to survive in our year, just if you're, you depend on it, but for light tasks, you use it right and you, you're able to treat the process processor right so that it doesn't slow down bog down on you then i guess yeah oh, you, you'll getting be all able sensual to... with this kyocera you got to treat that baby right you got to treat it good <laughs> i'm trying to see if this will register but it will <laughs> probably i'm trying to rub rub the pixel I mean, it's, it's funny that you're sort of struggling in the back i usually go to the i'm gonna rub it against my beard but um but <laughs> but it's on. it's the, like that's the case because okay. it's it's you have to treat because if, if you, you have to treat one part of it with care at least if you're not going to treat the other part with care so so not specifically the the q of the the duraforce pro verizon variant but is is there a big market for rugged phones in india right now mm, no okay so i'm, I'm <laughs> no, glad i'm glad that you had just a simple one word answer for this um i am a huge fan of kyocera's like armor build quality i loved the brigadier that phone was such a badass rugged and and the cool thing about the duraforce pro is that it also has the sapphire shield screen sapphire. so it's a synthetic oh. sapphire that is very yeah. scratch resistant you do have to be careful it's a little bit more brittle i have a huge caveat for recommending someone pick up a duraforce pro today and it has nothing to do with kyocera it's really the chipset in the duraforce pro is the qualcomm 617 i want to say 615 or 617 i can't uh, remember exactly 17. which I remember the Fine. performance. <laughs> at the Sorry. end of 2017 and looking at where we're going to go for 2018, that is not a chipset I have a ton of confidence in. If the majority of your use is very simple, getting to done, checking your email, pulling up, you know, a couple social media type apps or, you know, simple, simple interactions with a phone that you need to protect your data on, that could be a good fit for you. I would not expect a lot of software support. I would not expect a ton of updates. In fact, I don't know that I would want an Oreo update on a 61, uh, 61X variant chipset uh, this year, Qualcomm Snapdragon 615 or 617. Uh, so then that's where I have some concerns. Um, if in any way you can find another less expensive phone that takes you up into, I don't know, at least Qualcomm 625 territory, with um, nougat 625 is way better the 625 better. is so much better performance is so much better uh, you can't stop talking about it <laughs> are so much better and and if you can find a device and see that's what's tricky is I, i'm actually not as well familiar with verizon's lineup right now but it even if we're just cresting into that tier of performance and you can find a good rugged case and you can get yourself a screen protector i nice. think the overall enjoyment moving into 2018 will be higher than the actual smartphone use on something like the DuraForce Pro. I don't want to talk you out of the DuraForce Pro because that Sapphire screen is baller, but what you actually do on your phone is really going to decide how much of a compromise you're willing to take on that, on that processor. 
And it's a shame that Kyocera doesn't really make more phones or keep them up to date because you know, we, we all... find like they, they make these little step ups. They they had um what was during the uh, the Brigadier and the original Duraforce on AT and T. We had this great like Kyocera was getting on top of it. Great mid range solutions and some cool mm. tech. Like I loved their tissue conductive screens. So you didn't have yeah. an earpiece speaker. It was just a vibrate, the entire screen, the entire display was a vibrating membrane that would be oh, your speaker. So when you held it up to your face, you could hear so well in loud environments. <laughs> and then, you know, so they, they, a little bit of progress. And then I think it just took them a little too long to iterate for their next, their follow-up phones. And then they sort of backslid in the market and it's just the pacing. They need to find some way of, of kind of keeping keeping their presence known in the consumer space for those kinds of niche solutions because they could definitely be the kings of those of that niche you know they should be synonymous with durable phones with rugged lifestyle or rugged work uh requirements kiosera shouldn't just have to be a samsung galaxy s8 active right well and i like my s8 active but there's something so awesome about the the brigadier i freaking loved that phone jules why don't you take the next email Indeed. All right. Let's talk about Kojo Boadu's email. Uh, Hi, Pocket Now team. I'm gutted. I no longer get to listen live like I used to in the past, but I always catch it on Stitcher. Hey. Uh, I have been a Pebble Steel owner for two and a half years, and I need to replace it soon. That's the question here. I have a budget between 230 and 270 pounds, and I don't need features like GPS, a heart rate monitor, or NFC. I'm interested in the new Fossil Q Explorist, and was wondering if there was a review in this or the excuse me, if there was a review for this in the pipeline, or what watches you would suggest. He's an HTC 10 owner. Uh, I look forward to your suggestions. Many thanks and keep up the great work, Kojo. Thank you for listening. So what do you? So what do you think, Jules? Um, Fossil Fossil Q, or are you on board? Uh, the state of Android Wear 2.0 is... Oh, God, the one is so bad. A <laughs> shambles. Uh, I, I hate to say it. I don't want to say it. I mean, and if it weren't for the fact that Apple Watch isn't doesn't really play friendly still with Android. Like, uh, I really I want to downgrade to Android Wear 1.5. Seriously, uh, I need yeah, to find yeah, a way. That would be a good idea. That would, that would be a great way. If someone could make a ROM or, or a tool for that, that would be great. In terms of that, I would just go for the cheapest one that you can get. because I know that there's a timepiece. If you want one for the luxury, like the, the, the statement piece, I don't think I can help you yeah. as per my taste. My sense of taste is not really here. You would mm-hmm. have to talk to Juan for that. But in terms of the Fossil Q, it looks pretty exquisite. Uh, except the Explorist, it looks pretty exquisite. I can't find the and for what it, I can, I'm seeing like the Venture. The Q um, Explorist? Yeah, let me let me just pull up yeah. a different Fossil. You guys keep talking. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look this up right now. Yeah, the Marshall and the Explorist. So the Explorist right now in, in our territory is $255. Uh, and it has all, I mean, it has all the standard stuff. And even though he doesn't need a heart rate sensor i mean it, it, it i believe it has no, it has a fitness tracker no I, and, I believe it's just step tracking i don't believe they've got heart rate yeah you would you know po- polar is more kind of a what you want in terms of just solid that but in terms of just the explorist uh if you get a metal band i think that would look nice yeah uh, the state the stainless steel one looks pretty nice even though you pay a little bit more for it but uh, the three button uh, process and the um, crown, mm-hmm. I think, is definitely a, a more of a UI thing that you, people should follow in terms of. It's like the tick watch, but may, I mean, maybe that's not your style. But the tick watch was a pretty good, uh, the original the, one. The tick watch the, was like, a nice watch. Yeah, it was a nice looking watch, uh, and it also had the. Have you taken the, the not new the one? one. The the uh, I caught them at the indi- uh the crowdfunding stage at like uh one one twenty and one eighty or something like that. They're probably more like two hundred and three hundred or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I would uh, 
maybe the E because I, I if if we're going conservative and stylish, then maybe the it was I think it was the E that was more limited. It was Bluetooth only, or you know something going on there. But the TechWatch S, I feel well, is kind of well, Shimon. What 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 Android Wear are you using right now? Um, Moto 360 second generation. Yeah, so I mean, I've got my Huawei Watch too. I'm actually going to go. I think I'm going to break out my original Huawei Watch. Um, the original one looks so much better than the second generation. So that's kind of where I'm. I'm. I'm a little torn. You know, for a lot of the things that you're you're saying here, um, uh, da, 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 from this is from <laughs> Code Kojo. Say the name? Kojo. We'll say Kojo. Kojo. Um, so Kojo. <laughs> Sorry. I have the pronouncer uh, right there in the yeah, I know. Bin. Sorry, but it was I, I, I didn't realize that you had separated first and last name, and I was like, wait a minute, that can't be his first name. Uh, Sorry. Uh, so we're, we're looking at the, the Fossil Q. I really do like the look of Fossil watches, although I'm, I'm a little bit more of a fan of like uh, like Scoggin design. So I actually have a connected Scoggin Hagen, which I, I use as my backup watch. Um, or my I'm dressing up watch. I, I want something a little bit nicer than my Huawei watch, too. Um, the the Gen 3 fossils get rid of the flat tire. The screens are improved. I don't know anything about whether or not the battery life is looking better, but it is generally improved hardware over where we were on the Gen 2 fossil watches, which were all, again, very sort of just reference designy Android Wear fare. You were basically just paying extra for that fossil badging. I think they're a lot more competitive now. Considering what you were asking for, and that you don't care about things like like all of the additional features, I would be inclined to see if you can maybe find a first generation Huawei watch. It's it's a it's more of a a Movado look, you know, in terms of of watch design. It's really clean. You get it with a stainless steel bracelet, and I still think it's prob it's I mean up there with the Moto. It's up there as I think the cleanest look we've seen since on Android Wear. Um, it's not the most exciting because you're, you're getting an older watch design and I would recommend sticking with Android 1.5, Android Wear 1.5, not doing Android Wear 2.0. In fact, I don't even know if the Huawei watch ever got its full yeah. update to Android Wear 2.0. Um, so but, you're saying an original, uh, Huawei watch, you say? So yeah, I'm going to break I, mine back out. I found, I finally found the magnetic charger for it so <laughs> I can charge it back up again. Nice. I lost it. Um, but so you're yeah, saving pretty good on that at 120, 150 pounds, maybe. I, yeah, I mean, yeah. it shouldn't be expensive, and you could probably undercut your fossil by half with a design that is very that is so simple and so striking. Like I said, I think it looks a little like a Movado. Um, that that would maybe be my backup recommendation if you can shop one and you can find one that, if, especially if you can find one new. But if you can find one that hasn't been abused, maybe look at that, and then. And then if you can't, then consider switching over into the fossil territory for the more stylish fare. Um, you know, because obviously you're not looking at like an LG or something like that. <laughs> yeah. That's what I like about the um, Huawei watch and the Moto 360 watch. That they, don't, they don't look like a smartwatch. They look like regular watches. Nobody yeah. even thinks about that they are smartwatches. And I like about that. Like That's the best thing. Yeah, I mean, like the, the Huawei watch too has a little bit more of like... Um, like a, like a, like, well, I was gonna say like an entry level Casio, you know, like you wanted something that was a bit more rugged, but oh you didn't mind that it looked kind of like a big, chunky, rugged, cheap. I shouldn't say cheap, inexpensive watch. I, I don't mean to 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 slight Casio. I mean, uh, I think especially once you get up into like G-Shock territory, those watches are badass. But that's not my style. You're just um, sliding Huawei for its choice of design for well, the... but, but that's just it is is I feel like Moto and Huawei on the 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 circular watch faces that they that they helped really usher in. There's an influence on other watches. Like I I, I point to Movado as as being sort of a reference point for people who are more into watches than for tech. Um, but they don't feel like a poor emulation of a Movado. Whereas m while I wear my Huawei Watch 2 a lot, it does kind of feel like a poor representation of what a Casio should feel like on your arm. It's just that it's the only watch I have right now that that can survive the day battery life wise with constant heart rate tracking. And I really like that. So I continue to wear it. But it's not 
really my best example of style or fashion. And the second I want to show, you know, like I want to dress up a little bit, I want to wear a shirt with buttons. Um, <laughs> it's it's I move over into something like a sco my scoggin, or, or or I'll if I can charge it, go back to my Huawei yeah. watch. Stylish. Uh, I uh, Shimon, do you want to read the next one from uh, Paul Russell? If you have the paste bin document yes. up. Make I a have. guest read. You don't have to make the guest work. Uh, I mean, hey, hey. I mean, I'm trying to keep it awake too, so it's like it's yeah, near two o'clock. I like lost my so, sleep okay. by now. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you're so going what, into what? the second lap. Yeah, exactly. I don't need to sleep anymore now. <laughs> Okay, so Paul Russell says, Dear Pocket Now, since the launch of the Moto E4 Plus, I have, been, yeah, I have recently been considering purchasing something like it for a long-lasting work phone for calls and SMS. As I was researching what my options were, for a low-cost smartphone with high-capacity battery, I came across many handsets from Chinese manufacturers that I had not heard of, such as Doji BL7000 and Guitel K6000 Plus that have a larger battery, Better MediaTek SLC, oh god, MediaTek, and higher resolution <laughs> display than the E4 Plus that I'm using as my yardstick from sites like AliExpress and Banggood. In your opinion, is it worth taking a risk with these Chinese devices with their interesting take on Android and possibly poor security in OS updates? Not to mention potential Chinese spyware installed. Also, last year, I'm a little concerned about the thing blowing up. Would I be better off sticking with Moto or going uh, going for an Asus Zenfone Max or the upcoming Nokia 2 or something else from one of the other major and better recognized OEMs? And then he thanks you so, for the advice. Yeah. Well, I think it's I think it's kind of great that he's he's putting Nokia in as one of the major oh you know, like factors. Like they're just recently back. Oh, it's what? right in the first tier. <laughs> but yeah, exactly. I, I, That's I how much Note weight 7. that name still carries. I freaking yeah, love it. Exactly. I, I want to bring back the Note 7 because back when that debacle was uh, happening, I got a pitch from Elephone, which is also a, a thing in China, and they were pitching their own Note 7 S7 kind of design, their phone, and they've made the point that they've gone through multiple, multiple stages of testing for their batteries, and guaranteed basically <laughs> that it would not explode and that's what there's always this one spec that every manufacturer wants to uh, focus on or like even have phones that focus on just that one spec uh, e uh may too all about the selfie selfie phone selfie apps they've been pretty uh progressive on that one and it even made a splash in the u.s earlier this year so when it comes to just this unified aspect, this unified focus, they're just throwing things against the wall and seeing if it, if it works. And sometimes it works. Sometimes they get picked up on a slow day. And <laughs> most of the time it doesn't, I think. But, well, I mean, but I, th I think I made you so, Shimon, like, you know, are, are people, is, do you think that this feels like a risk, though? Are, are people risking, when we're talking about of. an ultra low cost phone? Because uh, the specific smartphone which he has mentioned, and or better yet, say these OEMs, they are not prevalent in India. If you want to get those, you will have to order via AliExpress or Banggood. So um, yeah, you do have a risk, but I'm more concerned about the software risk other than the hardware risk. Okay. Software in the sense that you won't be getting any updates or anything. That's true. The only software you get out of the box is like most probably you're going to be stuck with that software iteration. Like it's either going to be marshmallow. Uh, I don't hope nougat, but Kit Kat. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, Kit Kat. Or maybe ice cream sandwich. Why not? Why not? Let's just go all the way back. Well, and then also, yeah. I, I, I guess, like you know, it's it's one of those situations too where I would be a little nervous. I, again, I mean, if you're contacting our show, I have an expectation that you're probably more in touch with what's going on in the smartphone space. Um, so you're probably a bit more likely to be able to handle a certain level of your own tech support, hardware tech support and software tech support, at least more than the average bear. But I, 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 I would, if you're worried about, you know, the, the quality Spyware. assurance and you're worried about support, Spyware. then I really do think you're, you're looking at needing to stick with a brand that 
is uh, is a little bit more recognized in, in especially in your local area. I'm sorry, I, I don't know exactly where you're writing from. You know, if you're Canadian or from the United States or something like that, and and especially when you can kind of consider some of the deals like the new Moto E4 Plus. You know, we're we're talking about creeping up on that price point, but it's a Qualcomm 427 uh, Snapdragon 427 chipset paired with what is it? It's like a 5,000 milliamp hour battery. Is that what they've got on it? Yeah, oh. something close to that. Yeah, 5,000 milliamp hour battery on the newest generation of Qualcomm's ultra low power chipset. I don't know that you can find a combo like that at that price point from a pretty decent label. It's not like Lenovo and Motorola haven't been free of their own issues with things like spyware and bad software and stuff on their own products. But like that's a pretty solid combo that I wouldn't be too afraid from. And then knowing that, especially in Western markets, you probably have a, a, a slightly better avenue for support if anything goes wrong with that phone. Mm-hmm. In the phone you mentioned, like the Asus Zenfone Max, uh, I used it personally. It was good. Like You would use it for battery purposes, and it lasts a day easily. Like You can even pass, go past like two days or something if you use it judiciously. Yeah, but that's like if his concern is only battery life. Yeah, even Zenfone Max is a pretty good choice. Or get the BlackBerry Key One and, and yeah, just triple your Black budget. <laughs> and just triple your budget. <laughs> just pay I'm more trying to. I'm it. trying to look up what is the chipset on the Zenfone Max. Uh, four ten, if I recall correctly. Oh, okay, Oof. which is kind of tough, but hey. Yeah. All right, we have one <laughs> more. <laughs> If we're looking at just sort of you know the, covering the basics and and getting calls it okay stuff. calls it F- SMS but anything more than that even if you're trying to go through the settings. yeah but he legitimately said calls in SMS he wasn't trying to say like I need to be able to play th- 3D games uh, 60 frames per second and I only want to spend fifty dollars and maybe I'll give him a handshake just a little little, a well, well just a little bit more of that reception because you know <laughs> once we get into the four hundred six hundred series. You're talking about reception issues, and that's kind of okay. It, it, I, right. I mean, as I'll, owner I'll, of a 600 series, I'll, that was... I'll agree with you there. Let, let, I'll, I'll take this last one here. This is from Zane, uh, and sure. this is Shorbaji. Hold on Shorbaji? It's from Zane. Wow. Hey, Zane. Um, <laughs> I recently read The Verge's V30 review, and they dinged the phone screen as a low point. Many people on Reddit were saying either it's a rough screen or compared to Sammy, it doesn't stack up nearly as close. Some comments even went into LG's TV panels and woes. If you could, can you share your experience with the V30's display and how it stacks up to current flagships? Uh, thank you, and keep paddling, paddling along in the SS pocket from Zane. <laughs> So uh, you you have the smaller pixel, right, Jules? Yeah, I do. Okay, so you you've got the one with air quotes to good screen on it. And you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> to good screen. And and has the there been any V thirty traffic in your t- neck of the woods, Shimon? No, I'm like literally waiting for LG to launch V thirty, but there's no no signs of it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we were kind of in the same boat for a while here too. Like they announced <laughs> the phone, and then it was what, it was almost six weeks. It took six it weeks. Had, they had like the actual release, you know, like the announcement. Six weeks later, it was the release. It was pre orders, and then another two weeks. And then also, don't forget about those prototype units that we've been oh, yeah. carrying around for months and months and months. So, so here's my experience with the V30. Uh, uh-huh. My V30, and I am very lucky, is pretty good. Um, I think we showed a screenshot. I don't have it handy now where I, I did this low light test. One of the problems that we have, and this is kind of going back to uh, that first uh, question that we got from Jesse, you know, we, we, we instantly want to start comparing as opposed to really reviewing a product on its own merits. So the first, the first things that we start seeing are, I put this screen up against a Galaxy S8 screen and look, you can see it's terrible. And that I want to caution people against jumping into that echo chamber on just one or two samples of of a display because i think there is a very different conversation where most people when they're scientifically examining an oled will probably be disappointed by some aspect of that oled as opposed to the people that we see in some of those screenshots on the reddit conversations that i've been seeing who have legitimate problems 
So th that's, those are two very different audiences, IMO, when it comes to the V30. If you can pick up a V30 and, and while you're using it in an app, like you've got a web browser open and to the naked eye under normal usage conditions, you can see variance in your backlight in the, in the brightness of the screen. That is a situation where you need to go and replace that phone. If you are putting a static gray image on a phone screen and dialing it back to its dimmest conditions in a way like you would never use that phone, you will, you will see variance between different OLEDs and that's sort of, within a certain range of fault tolerance that's within a certain margin of error it happens on every single screen and especially if you're looking at photos where they're comparing the v30 against samsung 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 screens get dimmer than lg screens do at their lowest so if they aren't matching the brightness of the samsung screen and the lg screen then you're not really getting a fair comparison as to what those displays look like when they're driven at the same at the same brightness levels. So my V30 screen is brighter at the top and the bottom. It's it's actually it's funny. It's 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 pretty consistent where the the forehead and chin edges are brighter and then it just sort of gradually meets in the middle at something that's sort of an average brightness. I got very lucky. So what I like about the, the LG screen though, is that it's a little cooler color temperature when you don't have some kind of adaptive color mode on. And so I think my V30 screen is far more accurate than my Samsung screens are when you turn off adaptive color. On Samsung, both of my, my S8 Plus and my Note 8 are super ruddy red. And so you can talk about this, oh, LG screens have this blue color shift. Well, yeah, when you look at any screen off axis, like at an angle, you're going to see some change in the color represented on that screen. When I'm looking dead on my Note 8 screen, it looks like I'm on Mars. <laughs> but, and it's a bad so, display. So what are you, you more bothered by? $50 for it. And oh my God, hey, you you, you love bad screens. Well, well, you and, are and, a bad screen. And, and obviously I'm an LG shill fanboy paid by lg and you know all of that pocket now coverage is brought to you by lg because lg is the greatest life is good with friends um nice. the uh the, the the situation you know again if i put my note 8 screen to the same brightness at its lowest level against the v30 it is less consistent but it is it's a softer gradient so the top right corner is dimmer than the bottom left corner of my note 8 again i'm never going to use it that way so I'm not really that bothered by that kind of performance on my Note 8. So w ultimately, I'm sorry, I know this has been really long-winded and I, 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 I'm I using a chunk of what we've already done on uh, last week's podcast when we were talking about the Pixel 2 also. Um, so some of this is a little repetitive, but the, the thing that I think consumers need to be concerned of and why this is a bummer for LG is the variance is now just high enough that it takes some of the fun out of your smartphone purchase. I think everyone would agree, LG seems to have yet again, another issue with their QA as to what products are actually making it into the hands of consumers. And this is affecting not only LG phones, but the Pixel 2 XL. And so it makes it just a little bit more of a crapshoot when you get the phone in your hands and maybe something's a little wonky or something's a little off, that's going to make you feel less good about that purchase. I've had the phone for a couple of weeks. I'm not having any burn in my, my backlighting is pretty consistent and I like the color hue on my P OLED better than I have on more recent Samsung OLEDs to the same token. I think so far, I don't think any phones have bested the galaxy S seven era of AMOLED displays. I think those are still the most consistent, the most accurate, color screens I've ever seen. So even Samsung, in my opinion, has taken a step backwards by moving to this new aspect ratio. So um, talking about displays, I mean, we know that the OnePlus 5 has been a benchmark for Indians. Uh, Shaman, what did they make of the whole issue when when the jelly oh, scrolling thing came about or something like that? It just got, I mean, it didn't really get much traction over here. People just got over really? with it because Price, <laughs> because it's price, price. points. <laughs> it's cool. Nice to adapt to it. 
but but did, did, you, did you think it was kind of funny because if you remember way back in the day when apple started doing like scrolling on phones and there were lawsuits flying about like <laughs> whether or not you could have a bounce in your screen when it scrolled or android would have that like color shift so you would get to the top of a list and the the momentum of the scroll would result yes. in like a blue band scrolling up on on the edge of a menu um yes we used to make software to enable that kind of bouncy effect right <laughs> like that used to be a thing that we wanted yeah. and people would code into software and you're like no see oneplus just made a hardware version <laughs> jelly scroll. It's a feature, it's not a bug. <laughs> of course it's not a bug, it's a feature. <laughs> yeah. This 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 shill podcast brought to you by the fine folks at OnePlus and uh, they pay for every word that comes out of my mouth. Basically so they, they okay, I'm fun, absolutely yeah, being facetious. I'll give you a fun them. fact. Yeah. I'll give you a fun fact. All those um, you know the recent leaked renders of 5G which are being circulated around, mm -hmm. right? You know what those I wouldn't be taking names, but those are created by my friend. Oh, really? <laughs> really? Yeah. Good for them. <laughs> they they so, do rely on their Indian counterparts a whole lot too. Like this is a these are huge corporations with like lots of talented people all around the world. I mentioned that my friend was Indian. I didn't mention that. Hey, trying to get more info out of him. So I mean, just to kind of wrap up thoughts on on the V30. If everything else about the phone is what you're looking for in a device, I would still recommend trying your luck. You know, grabbing the phone and so long as you have a clear route for returning it or replacing it or getting support for any kinds of problems. I, I'm, I'm personally not as concerned about some of these, these issues until we see in, until we see, I think, a more concerted conversation um, from people that are, are having more systemic problems. This is this is not like boot looping. This is not like exploding batteries. Uh, this isn't even like bend gate on an iPhone. I, I I feel like this is this is something that it's easy to blow out of proportion when we're trying to examine a phone used in an extreme use case. Again, what I would look for specifically, and, and in, in immediately, you pull a Pixel 2 XL out of the box, you pull a V30 out of the box, you want to play with the screen brightness under some kind of app usage scenario to see if there's anything distracting about that performance from there. And if there is, get that phone back ASAP. And if that's enough to kind of make you gun shy, like you don't even want to have to take that kind of that kind of task on yourself, then I think you've already answered your question. LG this year is is not going to be for you. But I, I've been really happy with the camera performance. I'm super excited by the headphone performance. The microphones are on point. It's nice having wireless charging yeah. in a water resistant build in a fairly ruggedized you know shell that can that is supposed to be more impact. That's what you're paying eight hundred dollars for. That's what and, you want. And it's an eight hundred dollar <laughs> phone. I mean, like it's undercutting the S eight plus. So, so <laughs> I am willing to put up with the compromise of of slightly less even backlighting when used in an extreme case for me personally. <laughs> and uh, I, I'll be the first one to say I got really lucky that I do like the screen on my V thirty. I like it. Um, I know that might not be the case for everybody, but I, I don't feel that this is the big buyer beware. Uh, situation. And I'm really hoping that what this spurs on, especially from Google's perspective, is that one, Google needs to be way more active. If they're going to say it's made by Google and not made by LG, they need to get their asses in those factories and actually doing their own QA. First of all, True. that's that's yeah. mandatory. You know, the buck stops with Google on, on the Pixel 2 XL. But under that kind of influence, I would expect that LG's manufacturing will improve quickly over time. I'd say that the the LG OLED is probably two generations behind what Samsung could do. But even like I said, even Samsung took a minor step back, in, in my opinion, this year. So their ability to catch up as a company with some guidance from a menu, from a from an organization like Google could could actually result in this generation of phone improving over time. Let's see. We'll have to see. <laughs> yeah, and that's another thing too. Is maybe it's not the worst idea in the world to just sit out a couple months and see where we end up at the end of the year. Like if if you know for the G four, 
were uh, we were talking sure. about both yeah. throughout throughout <laughs> the life of LG G4. If we're still yeah. talking about you know manufacturing defects, color shift, and you know crazy um, inconsistent backlighting on the V30 by December there's a bigger problem at play here and again it's another thing that we'd need to knock lg on in terms of qa but the deals dude the deals buy one no, get deals, one the get deals a free at the end of the year battery. are gonna be awesome i mean we're talking about like price drops free... and bogos and stuff like that uh... never buy a phone brand new ever don't do it i mean even for the note 8 i was saying like i love this phone I don't know that I could ever recommend myself, you know, anyone in my family buying it well, on launch day at full price. It's like you got to have a trade in or you got to do a BOGO or you yeah. got to do something. Um, you know, that's 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 where these super premium products have kind of, again, made this conversation more difficult. But we can be pretty confident that a V30 at the end of the year, I think we'll see some pretty good deals on them. Just get again two hundred mega uh, two hundred gigabyte micro SD card. What happened to that LG? Hello, hello. I, you know anything? I, you know you don't even have to sell me on like a three hundred and sixty camera or VR headset or anything like that. Just you know. Okay, honestly, that... do you guys still use SD cards on your smartphones? Oh yeah, like micro SD cards. Well, I mean oh, yeah. this one this one's adapter. Uh, I hold on, I'm trying to get it out. You, you um you, you you do your thank you spiel and I'll I'll. I'll Okay. No, I, I I still definitely do, and especially when I'm moving back and forth between so many phones as as aggressively as I do, um, having a 128 that I know I can just like, oh, I'm just gonna go straight from my Huawei camera review right into my LG camera review or something like that makes it all really Can't easy. See, that's a 200. Um, and also because you know, like I have to send these things back, I don't want to have to worry about accidentally deleting something that <laughs> I liked on that phone, and then just lives on my memory card, and then I just you know keep tabs on that goes on into your uh, memories forever. Like literally and the just, last time I used a micro SD card on a smartphone was way back in 2014 or 2015, I guess. Really? Way back, Seriously. way back a whole year and a half what? ago. <laughs> yeah, way back. <laughs> <laughs> Who could even think that far back? Did I mean, I don't even think we had, you know, we had language or culture time. back then. I think we had just invented fire. That was two, yeah. that was two and a half years at least, come on. Come I mean, on. just I think it's remarkable how we went from the wheel in 2012 to where we are today. So, well, we also sure. went through that stage where the micro SD card was getting shunned by literally almost one. So, no, it, it's it's it still is for me, and and you know maybe I'm still old school enough on this, but media and storage, I you know like photos and videos, I I shoot so much that I really want all of the built-in storage on my phone just dedicated for apps and services. And so even though we've gotten some some you know, like I, I have a P10 plus with 128 gigabytes of built in storage, um, I kind of still don't want that being clogged up by the tens and tens and tens of gigabytes of content that I'm likely to produce with that phone. So I try to keep those separate. Interesting. Because, um, literally, you know, totally relying on cloud because I'm literally a cloud computing student. So I'm ditching physical hardware and totally moving towards the cloud. Like, even if I have to transfer like a file or two from my computer to my phone, I don't use that USB cable. I just throw it in the cloud and then download it on my phone. So, so let me ask <laughs> you, because this is something that I ran into with the Pixel 2. You know, the Pixel 2, we've got unlimited Google photo storage. Um, when I did the camera review, I shot 11.4 gigabytes of content. Mm -hmm. And that was over a two day period. And I needed to have access to that to look at every single photo quickly and, you know, examine the videos, get them into video editing apps. What would you have done with 11 gig of data all in one straight shot? Yeah, 11 gigs. Uh, USB cable to the rescue, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so so this, this is exactly why I, I sort of have to preface a lot of these things. Like I'm using, when I do a camera review, I am trying to encapsulate what someone would do with a phone over the course of like two months in 36 hours. Mm -hmm. So I am not a good test case for this kind of, this kind of behavior because personally I have very different requirements for what it is that I need to accomplish on a daily basis. But at the same time, I still run into issues like with family and friends, like they might have some kind of cloud backup solution, but 
something's going on with their phone. They've talked to the carrier. They're going to try and wipe the phone out first. And to oh. know that they've got everything backed up and saved, the cloud suddenly doesn't feel like the safest repository of all the stuff that was on their phone. And now they want to talk about finding the cable or plugging it into a PC or something like that. I'm still at a point where even in a first world country with pretty good data, not not the best, but pretty good, um, the cloud to me is still more of a, a redundancy, not my primary um same here. like i still have a physical you know backup copy of all of my data on my laptop or some hard disk space where it's something like that yeah and especially for me because you know, like, i i convinced the wife to to upgrade our nas so like you know nice i've got i've got you know like four massive hard drives under under my feet right now <laughs> While we both still use Google Photos and Microsoft OneDrive, I think for both of us, we have all of our all of our photos and videos backed up in triplicate. Wow, that's yeah. impressive. Yeah, we we don't want any any photo of the daughter like ever getting lost. <laughs> like, These are precious memories. We're gonna fight to protect them. Yeah, keep them. The have you like tried? Uh, have you like tried to exploit the unlimited storage of uh, Pixel, the first generation? <laughs> uh, no, you mean like trying to spoof a, uh, a phone yeah. ID on another device? Yeah, no, not like spoofing the uh, phone ID, but like just by loading you know, pictures oh, into the original Pixel and then backing them oh. up. Oh, <laughs> yeah, there you go, Jules. He got it. <laughs> oh no! Oh. Uh, did, did you actually get to uh, do uh, like external photos? Like you, you, because I, I was. Uh, I have a uh, I camera, wonder. a mirrorless I camera, and about. I can just upload to the phone just by I shoot, tapping it. I shoot a lot on my G85, and I could just be using the app to shift that stuff over. I need to play with In that. full res. 24 megabytes. All right. You know, uh, I, I have something that I need to go play with immediately. So I think we should wrap this podcast up. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a good <laughs> idea. I can I'd... break Google. Um, at 11 minutes past two yeah, and, in the morning. Thank you, thank you for joining us, Shaman. I, I know we kind of ran this podcast a little bit longer, but I really appreciated you jumping in. Thanks for having me, guys. It was really amazing. And I'm totally not going to sleep now. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Nap time. Me, I am so. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go get lunch. This is where Jules and I complain about doing the show on an empty stomach. And there you have it, folks. Another episode of the Pocket Now Weekly has come and gone. The show is over, but the conversation continues on Twitter, where Shaman is at Shaman IPS. Is that... Is that... That's a long story, but yeah, that, that's what it is. <laughs> okay, Shaman IPS, Jules is at Point Jules, and I'm humbly at Some Gadget Guy. Pocket Now is around the web, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Google+, YouTube, and our home site, pocketnow.com, and Spanish speakers can check out ES pocketnow.com shows like this cannot exist without your support sharing the weekly with your friends who love mobile technology and dropping reviews wherever podcasts can be reviewed once again we want to thank this week's sponsor app river definitely go check out how you can protect your email but ultimately there wouldn't be a show if it weren't for our listeners and subscribers who have kept us on the air since 2012 the pocket now weekly will be back next week with all kinds of delicious technology goodness so make sure you tune back in Boo.